All right. Hello. It's Jeannie Murphy here on I Love New Jersey Radio. I'm going to fix something. Can you see? There we go. Let me make sure my guest here, John Galena, Fle uh, Flemington, New Jersey, Hunterdon County, award-winning attorney, is here uh, with me now. I'm going to put my earphones on and give you a, an update on the weather here in um, central Jersey today. I hope you're having a great day. This is I Love New Jersey Radio. I'm Jeannie Murphy. I'm with Weikert Flemington. If you're looking to sell or buy a home, please let me know. We don't have enough inventory. Uh, don't be waiting around because there's buyers everywhere and everybody's holding off because of the spring, but it is spring here. And my guest today, John Galena, is going to talk to you about real estate. Learn from his side of the seat because every time you have a transaction, although it's not required, most of the time you're having an attorney review your work, what you're doing with real estate. So he's going to give us his insights. Today, sunny with a high near 51. Tonight, mostly clear with a low around 26. Thursday, sunny with a high of 59. Mostly cloudy on Thursday night with a low around 42. Then mostly cloudy again on Friday with a high of 68. And then mostly cloudy with low 48 on Friday night. Sunny all day with a high of 72 on Saturday, which is going to be a great day. Hope you're going to be out and about, and that's good enough for us for now. So, again, this is I Love New Jersey Radio, and my guest is John Galena, um, Flemington, New Jersey-based, award-winning attorney of law. Good morning. Good morning. Pull that closer, please, and speak okay. loud. Very good. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. Oh, that's good. All right, so tell us about yourself. Well, I'm an attorney, uh, of course, licensed in New Jersey. I've been practicing law since uh, 1982, so I guess that's about 37 years. I'm a sole practitioner in Flemington. I've had my own practice uh, for the past 25 years. Nice. So you're, uh, you're over there by um, ShopRite, correct? Yeah, it's the office complex. Uh, it's called Liberty Court, 260 Route 202. Mm-hmm. And now, okay, so you're award-winning. Let's start well, off with that. When you say award-winning, I was honored by the Hunterdon County Bar Association, um, given the award of Professional of the Year for 2018. That's that a was big a deal. Biggest honor of my legal career to wow. be recognized by my peers. Yeah. And that was a very big honor. Very appreciative of that. Okay, so I mean, give us an idea of what what were they evaluating? What's the criteria of being the Professional of the Year in your well, practice? Well, there's a committee that meets in. Um, I guess just based on, uh, you know, professional conduct, uh, professional qualities. Um, of course, I wasn't on the committee, so I don't know what the... You don't know exactly what the name was chosen. But you, yeah, but there's a lot of attorneys in the area. Yes, uh, but my name was chosen for this year, for 2018. It's an award they give out every year, and I was uh, fortunate to get it for the year 2018. I was honored. I think that you should be. Congratulations. Thanks. I want everybody to know that um, I am so interested in sharing with you information from John because so many times a client comes along buying or selling a house for I don't know how or why not but they don't know of an attorney they don't you know they haven't used one maybe yet if they're a new time a new first-time buyer or they just haven't needed one that you know lucky for them and so I wanted them to get to know you so that they could basically say oh I've, I heard about him I, I saw him on on, t on the you know, Facebook stream for the chamber, and that he's award-winning, and you're a specialist in, uh, tell us about your different practices, because I know that real estate's one of yeah, them. I do real estate, um, also landlord-tenant, uh, land use, I'm the attorney for four land use boards in Hunterdon County, uh, civil litigation, criminal law, municipal court. That's quite a, a lot. I mean, that really is, right? I well, mean, it's a, it's a general practice, and basically it's what, you know, a lot of uh, general practitioners, the areas that they engage in. So talk about, like, what, um, tell us about a, a day in your life um, with regards to real estate. Okay, with regard to real estate, the first thing that comes in is usually I get a call from either the client or a broker stating that there's a new contract coming in. Mm -hmm. And we'll take this from the, uh, from the view of the buyer because I guess there's a lot more activity involved. Just stay straight with that so that you okay. can... Okay, when you're representing the buyer. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I, I tell them is, have you signed a contract yet? <clears throat> Because on the New Jersey law, New Jersey law is a little bit different. Um, just to give you some history on that, back in the, um, the 1980s, the Bar Association sued the brokers, the real estate brokers, saying that you were preparing contracts and having people sign them, and that was the unauthorized practice of law. Hmm. I mean, also common, people would sign the real estate contract and then, I guess, realize afterwards maybe there was something in there they didn't like when they brought it to an attorney. So the, the um, Bar Association sued the real estate brokers. Uh, Wait, when was that? Back in the, in the early 80s. Okay. 
stating that um, you were engaged in the unauthorized practice of law. So the litigation was resolved, and it was resolved by way of a consent order. And the consent order's term said, in every broker prepared real estate contract, you had to have certain language. Okay. Which is called the attorney review language. Mm -hmm. So you could sign the contract, all parties could sign the contract, but it wouldn't be binding. <clears throat> you would have a three-day attorney review period, and that's three business days, in which either party had the opportunity to say, I disapprove the contract and you wanted certain amendments to it. Mm -hmm. If neither party does anything for three business days after both parties get a fully signed contract, the contract becomes binding as written. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's very important um, when you first start a real tra transaction for the client to get with the broker to get the contract over to you so you can review it mm -hmm. and get your um, review letter out. And what you have to say in that review letter is, the magic words initially are, I have reviewed the contract and would disapprove it in its present form and then go into the, uh, the items I'd like in the contract. Then it would just proceed as part of negotiation until the parties agreed on all the terms. But that's one thing um, you know any buyer or seller in, in a new real estate contract uh, has to be aware of. And again, that three-day review period begins to run when both parties get a fully signed copy of the broker-prepared contract. And again, that only a, the three-day review period only applies to broker-prepared contracts. What's the difference? I mean, okay, I want everybody to know because uh, you said uh, you, when you're talking, you're s such an attorney, and so you've got it like exactly, precisely, exactly. And I'm thinking, ah, ah, I'm gonna everybody to know what he said. I'm being an interpreter. Okay. You you were saying, okay, so if, say you were actually sitting there and representing the buyer, mm -hmm. and you a client calls up and says, I have just written out this contract with my real estate agent, mm -hmm. and I need you to look at it because I don't even know what it says. And then I, I'm, I'm your buyer, right. and I go to you, and the first thing you say is? I would tell them you could go ahead and sign it. Mm -hmm. And I'd say there's a broker, you know, it's a broker standard uh, New Jersey uh, approved form of contract. Mm -hmm. You can go ahead and sign it. It's not going to be binding yet. Mm -hmm. What you do is uh, the three-day attorney review period won't start to run until all parties get a fully signed copy. Mm -hmm. But I ask them to get the contract to me so I could start reviewing it. So um, I... I I do this for a living, but I want to make sure we're clarifying for you all too. So um, if you, okay, say you and I, are, you're the seller and I'm the buyer, okay. and my real estate agent, me, um, gives a uh, signs contract, we sign it at the same time, or maybe let's just say you live a half an hour away, okay. and it's a Thursday afternoon, and the real estate agent says, okay, I, the buyers made the offer, the real estate agents presented the offer, the seller's getting, an he's going to sign it at 6 o'clock on a Thursday night. Okay. I've already signed it. Now the seller signs it at 6 o'clock. When does the attorney review start? It starts the next day. You don't count the day you sign the contract. You start the next day. And again, that's only business days. So you don't count weekends or holidays. So okay. say, for example, you sign at 6 o'clock on a Thursday night, mm -hmm. you know, when everybody's got a signed copy then. Attorney review period will begin Friday. You don't count Saturday or Sunday. We could uh, go for Monday and the close of business on Tuesday. Okay. So if I offered you... $250,000 for your home that you own and you agreed and I said that I was going to have a normal bank loan and it was only going to take me 30 days to close and you were like that's great so you say okay so then you and I we go into attorney review and then you are looking out for me as a, I'm talking back as an attorney now so tell us about like the inspections and the typical things that you look for to protect your clients okay well after you complete attorney review the mm -hmm. contract will usually set forth the time period for inspections and the time period if you're getting a mortgage in which you have to get the mortgage mm -hmm. and we'd also have a closing date so the first thing is you arrange your inspections you go through your inspections and most contracts would have um, you know the provision you're going to do a home inspection um, inspection of all systems. If there's a, a well, you're going to test the well water. Although in New Jersey, the seller generally tests their well water. Mm -hmm. If there's a septic system, you're going to test that. You're going to have a, an insect inspection for termites. You get the results in, and then you send that to the other attorney, the seller's attorney, asking him, you know, making the request for what you want fixed. And usually um, in the contract, it states that, uh, you know, the, the seller then can either say, yeah, I'll do it, or no, I won't. You'll agree on what items the seller's going to fix. Um, if you can't, maybe you could agree on some kind of a, what they call a concession, mm -hmm. where the seller would uh, give you um, a credit, which would be applied against your closing costs. That's great. Okay, so, um, all right, so in the attorney review stage, that's the three days, uh, basically 
the buyer and the seller are both not obligated to continue on if, unless, it, especially if the attorney finds something that's not appropriate and they're yeah. looking out for they get back out, right? Yeah, I've had instances where, um, you know, for some reason a party would change their mind and then you get the letter stating that, uh, you know, we've disapproved the contract and we won't be proceeding further. Okay, well, I want to talk about that. We're going to go to our first break real quick. It's really, really short. I'm Jeannie Murphy. It says, I love New Jersey radio, and I love this show, and I love saying that. I, I hope you get a kick out of it. I really mean it from my heart. Do you love New Jersey or what? You bet. You bet. <laughs> We're both hundred and county residents, too. Um, John Galena is our attorney here, award-winning, and he's from Flemington. He's talking about real estate matters, and we'll be right back. Stay with us. Rab Coins of Flemington, New Jersey has been in business for over 40 years. We are highly competitive buyers of gold, silver, and platinum coins, jewelry, and scrap metals, and have recently been named the exclusive gold buyer for Diamond Nation and HealthQuest. We also provide professional appraisals, sales and liquidation services for individuals, law firms, estate trustees, and bank trust departments in New Jersey and Philadelphia. Products and services include gold and silver, American and foreign coins, certified rare date and modern coins, numismatic supplies and books, gold, silver, and platinum bullion, paper currency, United States proof and mint sets, including current issues. From junior collector to the experienced investor, RabCoin has been for the industry since 1974. Founder and owner Randy Block has been an expert and an active member of the coin industry for over 45 years. Visit us at 56 Main Street in historic downtown Flemington or call toll-free 1-800-819. 9875. You're listening to WHCR DB, HuntertonChamberRadio.com. Brought to you by the Hunterdon County Chamber of Commerce, the voice of business. This is Tony Clark, para planner at Patton Heidi and Associates. Americans believe they should be in charge of their own future, how they will live tomorrow. Since 1894, Ameriprise Financial has worked for their clients' futures, helping millions of Americans retire on their terms when they want, where they want, doing what they want. Today, Patton Heidi & Associates, a financial advisory practice of Ameriprise Financial Services, Inc., remains true to the vision of always putting clients first. We are ready to help you put a confident retirement more within reach. Put the strength of a leader in retirement planning to work for you through a personal one-to-one -one relationship. Patton Heidi & Associates will work with you to develop a plan to help you pursue your retirement goals. Call today at 908-713-6600. Offices located at 1318 Route 31 North, Annandale, New Jersey. Investment advisory products and services are made available through Ameriprise Financial Services, Inc., a registered investment advisor, Ameriprise Financial Services, Inc., member FINRA and SIPC. Advancing Hunterdon is an ever-sharp focus on the growth and prosperity of Hunterdon County's businesses. Advancing Hunterdon engages businesses within and throughout the county that are responsive to a call to action as the next chapter in business success. If your business and organization wants to get engaged, contact the Chamber today at 908-782-7115 or give us an email at info at Hunterdon. All right, here we are, back on the air. In four seconds. Economic growth for the business here we go. Welcome back to the show. This is I Love New Jersey Radio, and we um, specialize here on the Hunterdon County Chamber of Commerce, uh, Hunterdon Chamber Radio, featuring the assets of our lovely county, Hunterdon. And um, one of them is our attorney friend here, is award winning John Galena from Flemington. Um, he has a he, you were full service as far as uh, your your attorney practice goes, but we're specializing today on really real estate because that's what this show's about so go ahead you were going to talk okay. about yeah i guess we where we dropped off last time was about um when you want to cancel the contract mm -hmm. during the attorney review period now there's a lot of history that goes back to that um because when the consent order was first entered where you had to have that attorney review language in the contract it was back in the early 80s Okay, before the days of fax machines, before the days of computers. I was there then, worked no for internet, Whitell. <laughs> no internet, no cell phones. So what it stated is that you had to send out the uh, notice of uh, disapproval by certified mail, and everybody was doing that. But now as we went along, uh, fax machines came on the scene. So what you would do is you would call the other attorney and say, can I send my letter by fax? And they would usually say okay. Then when fax machine, you know, when everybody had a fax machine, everybody was just doing that automatically. Mm -hmm. Then, when computers came around, yep. people started sending them out by email. Mm -hmm. 
And there was a case where somebody got the, uh, the notice by email. And this is before they changed the language in the contract. They have since changed it, but this language still said by certified mail. So there was a lawsuit over that saying, well, you didn't send it to me by certified mail. And, and the court said, look, you're putting form over substance here. You got it. You received it. So that's what counts. So now the realtor's uh, form has been changed to state. You can send it by certified mail if you want to, or by fax, or by email. Mm -hmm. So virtually everybody today sends things by email. In fact, uh, a lot of attorneys don't have fax machines anymore. I know. I was going <laughs> to say, what about like that? Because you're, you've been in the practice, and I've been in the real estate agency world, and it's like back in the day where you had to literally drive the paperwork yeah. over to your office and stuff from the well, real estate agents to the, to the attorneys. That's what I call the technological stone age. Yeah. Yeah. When it was all, so you, you know, no, no cell phones, no internet, no, no email. It will now, all I have to do is go on Google Maps and put in like 20 properties and it will sort them right. by my destinations. I don't even have to think about it. But it's back in the day, you had to figure out a route, go preview it ahead of time and all this. You just yeah. tell your phone, take me there. That's right. Now you just, uh, and it orders, you know, yeah. You get the document ready. It's on your computer. You just, you know, send it out by email. You don't have to worry about, you know, going and getting certified mailings and going to the post office and sending it I don't know it how out. we but did it back then. We did it, you know. That's all we had. It's gotten just so much faster yeah, now, too. Yeah. Yeah. So then again, okay, so then basically, okay, here's a question I'm sure. I get this a lot, okay? okay. This is for you guys out there who are new home buyers. Um, they're terrified of presenting an offer because of attorney review, because of the fact that there's multiple offers going on, that they feel like they're going to put in an offer after it's accepted to an attorney. And that basically, because of the three days, another offer could come in, so they're going to retain the services of an attorney to be outbid in those three days. Does that happen a lot with you? Very, very rarely. Usually when somebody it's accepts unethical offer too. and it goes to contract, um, I suppose that in the interim, you know, um, somebody else could present something. However, you have to be careful because there was a case where in that three-day attorney review period, they agreed they had a contract, and then they tried to void it still within that three-day review period. The court said, no, you have a contract. You know, you're bound now. You can't now just say, I want to void it even though you're still in the review period. Wow, so how did that happen? That's that's cool. It must have happened really fast. I mean, the yeah, yeah. <laughs> they decided they had a deal, then I guess they changed their mind. But now, once you have a, once parties agree on everything, you're bound. And you can you can agree on everything before the three days, correct? Yes. So like, it basically means like, say this worried, like these these worried buyers, if if, if the offer's so good and the seller's totally into it, and they've written even a letter to the sellers to make them heart strung pulled, mm -hmm. then if they go into the attorney review having the three days, but everybody agrees that there's no problem with it in the first or second day, then you could be out you of can attorney, agree review. And attorney review. That's and, correct. And yes. that's a big deal out there for you people who are worried about that because that's a good thing. Because right. I do see where they're concerned because they end up being hesitant to put in an offer because they're afraid they're going to end up having um, it. Well, they have to understand, you know, for this, to, for their offer to go anywhere. They've got to get a contract and get into attorney review. Yeah. I think it's one time, once they do it once, even if it's rejected, they realize it's not that terrifying of an experience. Yeah, but when I you mean, start talking lawyers to new new young people, they, they get so freaked out that it's like they think it's like they're like signing off their life and everything, where it's really supposed to be an enjoyable well, it's experience. it's the biggest investment of your life is a yeah, house. Yeah. But um, you know, the attorneys are so friendly, and they actually handhold you and make sure you feel good about going through it. They're looking out for you. So don't be afraid of attorneys. Like, for example, when they had you know, inspections. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, people put all this money out for inspections. Then they find something, say, for example, really serious, like a very bad septic system mm -hmm. that's going to take, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars to fix, and, the, and this, you know, the seller won't do it. Unfortunately, then, you know, if you can't uh, agree, you have to move on. Mm -hmm. And then the buyers are disappointed because they, you know, I mean, they like the house, and, uh, you know, they've gone through all this expense to do the uh, inspections, but it's a necessity. you got to mm -hmm. have that done. Mm -hmm. So what about, like, what is some of your kind of, like, worst case stories of things that have fallen through that you just couldn't help? You know, basic repairs that, were, that they wanted done, like, you know, problems with the electrical system. Or, you know, what I see quite often is uh, people that have owned the house for a while. I always put in my contracts that the seller has, has obtained permits and approvals for any changes or renovations that have been done. A lot of people, um, you know, have done approvals, uh, or rather, have done renovations uh, without benefit of permits. Sure. So then, there, uh, then you know, what I usually put in my contract it states that um, if you haven't gotten a permit, you have to go get one. Mm -hmm. 
it's usually after the fact, but uh, you know, you go and you ask the inspector to come in and look at it and, and change whatever is necessary. I've never really seen anybody get penalized uh, because of that, but. Um, yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. I've seen that as well as on the real estate side, where it's like you, you, you know, when you walk downstairs and they said, "Oh, I just did my basement over three years ago." You're going, "I hope you did it with the permit, but let's see what else you got." And right. then basically you come to the attorney and they're like, "Prove that you have it." I have seen some very, um, I want to say, lenient in, inspector people that come in and they they're like, "You know what? This is basic. This is no big deal, and it's not as terrifying an experience to get it as as you would think sometimes, right?" Right, right. I mean, it's not like um, I once had one where somebody decided uh, they had a sunroom put in, you know, in addition, mm -hmm. without getting any permits. And that could, you know, they lost the deal. That caused a whole lot of problems. Mm -hmm. And plus, then it didn't comply with zoning regulations the way it was built. It was over the, the property line, and that was a nightmare. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. Right. So what about, okay, so tell us more about some of the experiences that you've had and some right. more words of wisdom. Well, so one of the things you have to get, um, whether or not you're getting a mortgage loan or whether it's a cash deal, is you have to get uh, what they call title insurance. Mm -hmm. It's an insurance policy that your title will be good. So they search back the title, you know, um, for the previous owners and everything, and make sure that uh, you know the title's in order and that the owners are in fact the owners mm -hmm. and the title is good because they've had instances where people that didn't even own the property uh, contracted and sold, and then yeah. then they split and. These people are finding out the, you know, these people that sold this property weren't even the real owners. All right. Well, I'm going to ask you a question. This was not in my planned conversation today, uh -huh. but by coincidence, I had a person walk into an open house I was doing this past weekend, a couple. Is it okay if I ask you this? Certainly. Okay. So, especially because of your planning board things, you've got so many things going on in your award winning. John Galena, Flemington, <laughs> New Jersey. Um, okay. So, this, they, this couple walks in and they tell me that they live in the area in Hunter County. And basically, they had bought what was a low-income housing property about five years ago. You mean, a, um, I guess they call it a Mount Laurel house? I guess. Income, it, income, uh, it was uh, something. Level, yeah. I don't think I, that may or may not matter. So what they're describing... Well, they call it affordable housing. Yeah, rates. it's affordable yeah, housing. You have to be the income guidelines. Right, right, right. Uh, only my question I'm saying, I don't know if that, if, if that has a lot to do with this, but here's the deal. So they're like freaking out because they bought the house for like 190000 and it's really worth like 330000 but because it's affordable housing, it's got this thing. Right. So when he bought it, basically they had the title work done, there were no liens on it, and then all of a sudden he refinanced a year or two later, it went through again, cleared title, and nothing was, uh, there was no lien. Then he went now to go refinance five years later, and they have this lien on it for like they said like something like twenty thousand dollars. That's because of the affordable housing uh, deed restriction thing that was never there before, with a dollar value. And I said, I don't know if you have anything to say. Go ahead. Well, I said, go back to your title insurance because that's what title insurance is supposed to be for. That's what you pay for. People don't even know what title insurance is, right? Right. They think it's about the property. And not even necessarily the person, too. So that may be something worth, you know, talking about. Yeah, see, generally, uh, when you talk about affordable housing, generally when it's an affordable housing unit, it has to be deed restricted. Mm -hmm. So that should have been in the deed. Mm -hmm. And the title company probably should have noted that. You know, unfortunately, I also had an instance where someone refinanced and got the loan, and it was uh, the mortgage was in excess of the affordable housing, you know, resale value. Oh, wow. So and it wasn't picked up. Yeah. So uh -huh. who's responsible? Like, where does the buck stop? Does the title insurance company, isn't well, that? If you know, so, well, you know, you can go back to the beginning. When a unit is housing, you know, uh, income restricted mm -hmm. and resale is restricted because it's an affordable housing unit, that's got to be in the deed. Mm -hmm. It's an affordable housing unit. Mm -hmm. So everyone should be aware of that at the beginning. Right. And then if it clears title, passes title, person moves in with clear title, Right. And then all of a sudden, a lien comes on it later. Isn't well, that? Well, if, if somebody neglected to put it in the, de in the deed and the title company neglected to state it was an exception, you know, you potentially have a claim against uh, either the township or the, uh, or the title company. Yeah, because I, I, I'm sorry. I got to be honest with you. I was so, like, I'm not an attorney. So I'm just right. standing there selling houses, and this adorable couple comes in with this problem. And I said, you have got to talk to an attorney about this. I, but when I was listening more and more, I kept thinking, you know what? People don't even understand what title insurance is. They just don't. Like you said, you're the attorney. We know that 
part of the process of selling a home or with our buyers is that they're going to have to have a mortgage banker if they need one. They're going to have to have an attorney if they need one. They're going to need a title company, blah, blah, um, inspectors. But for you, when when you talk about like that it is required to have the title, and like you say, when they don't understand, sometimes the title isn't even, it's, it's not clear. So can you explain what that means right. and exactly what title insurance uh, is? Title insurance, for, you have to have title insurance uh, if you're getting a mortgage. If it's right. a cash deal, you're not required, but no attorney in his right mind would do a closing and without tell title No insurance. person in their buyer, right. no buyer or owner would ever go to closing so without a title search. What will happen is uh, the title company will do the search mm -hmm. and they'll send a copy to the attorney, mm -hmm. both attorneys, and they'll review it. You know, it states who the owners are and where they got the property from. Then it'll have um, what they call uh, exceptions. Mm -hmm. Exceptions are things like judgments or liens. If you have a judgment against you, against the, uh, the seller, if it's been documented in the superior court, it'll show up mm -hmm. as a lien. So basically what he's saying is that there's companies that go in on behalf of the mortgage companies under, like, you know, the supervision, I guess you should say, of the attorney who's watching to see what happens. And basically the title company is looking at the house and they're looking at the title and how the um, title's transferred to different owners over the years. And then they also want to see if there's any tax liens or judgments right. on the people who live in the house. Because in order for the title to clear, for the attorney to sign off and say, yes, we're going to go ahead and close, all of that has to be paid back or handled, correct? Right. Say, for example, all right, Gene Murphy is buying a house. Jeannie. Jeannie Murphy. So what they, what <laughs> you they will know do, that. All right, go ahead. What? They'll put your name into a computer right? to do a judgment search. Anything that sounds like Jeannie Murphy will right. come back. Yep. Most of the time, you know, or all the time, those judgments won't, won't be against you, so you'll sign a sworn statement that they're not against you but against somebody with a similar name. Uh-huh. If they're against you, then that judgment's got to be paid off at closing. Just like also the title company will look and see if there's any outstanding mortgages on the property. Mm -hmm. And they have to be paid off at closing. Like seconds and so on. Yeah, at first, the second and equity line all has to be paid off. Mm -hmm. Do you um, see that a lot? Uh, oh, oh, almost everybody who's selling has some kind of mortgage. Yeah. What and about that, other things, like on the day of closing? Because the title work usually comes well, in li rundown. last, right? They do a rundown, uh -huh. um, you know, which covers from when the title search uh, comes into when the closing date is. And they send you, uh, you know, a notice of what they found. And it's really close to the closing date too, because it's the last thing, right, that happens. Because right. they want to make sure up until the last day, someone doesn't go gamble it away or something, right? That's correct. Yes. Uh, like if somebody didn't. That's what I learned a long time ago in my real estate class. Sorry. Okay. And also, what the title company does is file a notice for settlement that protects gives buyer protection um, that there's the property is going to be sold. Mm -hmm. So that um, and it's, uh, I believe it's 45 days before closing. The title company will file that. They file it with the county clerk. And uh, so when you get to closing, everything should be fine. Um, so, like, what know? if you're, like, one day before the closing? Like, even if you have maybe that day or something, and all of a sudden the title company says, uh-oh, wait a second, we found this. This was back right. from 30 years ago. What no, happened? They, they wouldn't find that from 30 years ago. Maybe, uh, like, if in that interim time period, uh, the person had a judgment entered against them. Okay. That would show up. Okay. Then that would happen. Oh, so they closing. do like a last one minute yeah, circle a around? Rundown a rundown. Okay, cool. Yeah. I didn't know that. I don't pay that much attention. But okay, so then what happens? Like, you say it's about to close and there's a situation. And I'd say, okay, how much is the, the title company would probably tell you what to do. Usually it's like, say, for example, there was a, uh, a judgment that came up um, that turned out to be against the seller. Mm -hmm. uh, it would have to be paid off at closing. Now, if you couldn't get, if you couldn't reach who the attorney was for the, uh, you know, the judgment creditor to get a payoff letter or something, the title company would uh, require you to hold certain monies in escrow. Oh, okay. And, you know, but the thing is, uh, a lot of lenders don't like escrows being held. Why? They just want everything clear. They don't want any money hanging out uh, yeah. under these these new regulations now where everything's got to be neat and clean. And yeah, up as and you know where this, the, where this, I guess that where you're also probably, where I see this is in refinancing, not just buying and selling, but when, when someone's refinancing and they're paying off their old loan right. and the <laughs> monthly payment says, oh, do you don't have a payment for not 60 days, and then there's, oh, they didn't pay their loan this month or something like that. That's when they have those last minute things too, yeah, right? Yeah, see, that's why um, generally who's ever handling the closing, either the buyer's attorney or the title company will contact the lender mm -hmm. and want a payoff letter good as of a certain date also asking for a per diem thereafter. Mm -hmm. um, but, and the lender will also state in its letter that this, these figures are good until such and such a date. So mm -hmm. if the, the, letter, you know, the letter expires, you've got to get a new one. 
I love the way he can just man all that. We, you know, you're, when you're an attorney looking out for the, the couple, you're, this is what you do when it comes to real estate transactions, w- watching all this happen. And the buyers really don't have to do much. They just have to make sure that they can afford with a qualifying letter from the mortgage company when they go into the offer and stick with not overspending or using anything well, to see, disqualify. Especially nowadays now that the regulations have tightened up since the the foreclosure debacle some years yeah, ago. Yeah, I want to hear about that from you. Um, when the days of deregulation, the mortgage rules got very loose and they were giving you know mortgages out very liberally. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, you know, a lot of these people were marginal and they couldn't afford it. And right. There was this big wave of foreclosures in the future. Mm-hmm. So what happens now is that, um, you know, I tell people when uh, you get a mortgage commitment, um, you get the commitment, but, you know, it's going to go through many sets of hands before you get the final approval and clearance to close. And, and, and it proves to be somewhat frustrating. Mm-hmm. You know, it'll go from uh, the broker to uh, the mortgage broker to, to underwriting. Now, the underwriter has got to want certain, like, they may want certain additional financial statements, et cetera, oh, yeah. et cetera. Well, the first person is kind of a salesperson because they're trying to get the mortgage, um, right. uh, you know, to their company because you've got options in all the, all the banks and every, every mortgage company. Right. So once they actually get you and give you the pre-qualification letter, then you go to the underwriting person who's the opposite of the salesperson. He's like not selling. He wants the to. The written commitment is what counts. Yeah. So, yeah. And the conditions in the commitment. But it's great satisfied. when you have a great mortgage person who's up front at the beginning and actually does say, you know, this isn't just about getting your business you're either going to really qualify or you're not because right. being run around is like the worst reputation for a mortgage banker yeah but, but uh, you know unfortunately with all the new regulations um it goes through a lot of different sets of hands mm-hmm. that's good and uh it proves to be certain frustrating because it, like, yeah you know, to the buyer to the new buyers close? when are you going to yeah. close to close yeah. also yeah. Uh, to note that uh, when you have your closing date in your contract the closing date in a contract is only what they call an estimated date. Mm-hmm. So say, for example, you have a contract that says they're going to close, uh, say, April 15th, all right? And that date comes and goes. You're not bound by that date unless both parties are ready. However, after that day passes, either party can serve what they call a time of the essence notice. And generally, the waiting period is 10 business days where, you know, you have to you send out the notice to the other attorney. And generally, that goes by certified mail. Uh-huh. And you state, you know, we'll be ready, willing, and able to close on this date. If you don't close on that date, you're in breach of contract. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that usually um, serves to get everybody moving. Yeah, everybody does as much as they can. And then if they can't, they can, what, charge per day? What do they usually yeah, resolve um, that with? Seller can, try to, can charge its daily carrying costs mm-hmm. for the property. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, it's funny because uh, sometimes, I don't know how many people really care about this question, but I'll ask anyway. Where we at when you have a domino effect and it's right, like, yeah. you know what I mean? This is important because it's like I'm selling my house and I'm closing on the 15th of April and I want to move into my new house four yeah. hours after I close on that one because I'm moving over to this one so I can move in tonight. And all of a sudden you get a hang up on one end and then you've got like this chaos yeah, it's so how do you handle fine. that i guess that's you fine. worry about your deal <laughs> i know i love it I, i'm joking your deal, your client you yeah. worry about your client's deal you yeah. put that first and foremost and then get that taken care of and everything will fall into place eventually and it does yeah. do they okay so uh, were you okay so say that you i was selling my house on wednesday the 15th of april but i can't close on buying my house until thursday or friday morning now i'm stuck and i can't get a hotel say would you allow, if you were the seller's attorney, for the buyer to rent for a night and move in before the change yeah, of title or it's not? It's not really what they call renting. Um, very often you have what's called a use and occupancy agreement. Mm-hmm. And you make sure you say it's not a landlord-tenant relationship because the tenant has all kinds of rights in New Jersey. Yeah. Since you say it's a use and occupancy, that they could go in, you know, they, once they're in, they take the house as it is, they're responsible for any damage. If for some reason the deal doesn't close, they've got to move out by a certain date. And to make sure they do move out, you put in the, the agreement that uh, if they don't move out by a certain date, then the rate's going to be $100 a day. Yeah. And that if I have to take you to court to have you put out, you agree to pay all attorney fees. Yeah. And again, stating this is not a landlord-tenant relationship. Right. That, yeah, that's got to be a whole other conversation. The parties are generally hesitant to do that, to let somebody move in your house yeah. before closing. I know. But if it, it, it does at times tend to, tend to solve a lot of problems, too, about people can't go here, they can't go there, they can't find a place to stay. Yeah. As long as you have a strong enough use and occupancy agreement, uh, you're usually okay. Yeah. I'm glad I asked because I know people out there are trying to think of what, what questions people were wondering or thinking about when it comes to an attorney. Um, do you have any other special? Like, um, I, It's kind of funny to me about talking about landlord-tenant relationships, but 
We have about three minutes till we go to the break, so maybe okay. at the end of the show we could talk a little bit about Certainly, that. Certainly, because I do a lot of that. Yeah, tell us about like um, other real estate transactional things you see in this area, particularly. Okay, that generally, are common. Um, if you're going to uh, buy something, if a buyer's going to buy something that's being rented out, oh. and they want to live there, mm -hmm. uh, the landlord has to give the tenant 60 days notice. And it's got to be a very specific notice stating that the property is under contract of sale and the buyer wants to reside in that unit. Now, you can't cut sh a lease short to do that. Right. Meaning, so, so if, I had a, if I were renting from you and I had a contract that said I'm staying until September 30th, 2019, but I decide my, I'm, a, I'm a selling my house, whoever, the, my landlord is selling the house and I have a mm -hmm. contract, I, can't, I don't have to leave until September 30th, correct? Right. So when does the six? Well, if you have a lease that says you don't. Yeah, have to the rent. lease, right? So when does the sixty-day notice apply? You could run it to, like, say, for example, if the lease expires September thirtieth, you have to serve it sixty days in advance, mm -hmm. two months' notice, to make sure it coincides. Mm -hmm. That way, if the tenant doesn't leave, um, you know, you have grounds to evict the tenant. But that notice is key. New Jersey law is very pro-tenant. Oh, God, yeah. And it reads like a roadmap for the different grounds for evicting tenants, but for um, evicting a tenant because um, the property's for sale and the n new owner wants to live there has to specifically be given in that time period, 60 days notice. Does it, what if the con what if, say a, a renter had been there for multiple years, but it was a one-year lease, and every year, it sa in the original contract, it said you can kind of stay month to well, month, you happens, can stay year yeah. to year, and then all of a sudden, it's like, no, this time... Well, We're under, selling. New, under New Jersey law, mm -hmm. once a lease expires, it automatically converts to what they call a month-to-month -month tenancy. So mm -hmm. a new tenancy begins at the beginning of the month and ends at the end of the month. Mm -hmm. And that's how it goes. Okay. Um, I, I love yeah. all this stuff. I hope you do, too. We're going to go to our break right now. I'm Jeannie Murphy. This is I Love New Jersey Radio. And my guest, John Galena, is an award-winning attorney here in Flemington, New Jersey. We're talking about real estate matters. So stay with us. We'll be right back for our uh, last break here. Rab Coins of Flemington, New Jersey has been in business for over 40 years. We are highly competitive buyers of gold, silver, and platinum coins, jewelry, and scrap metals, and have recently been named the exclusive gold buyer for Diamond Nation and HealthQuest. We also provide professional appraisals, sales and liquidation services for individuals, law firms, estate trustees, and bank trust departments in New Jersey and Philadelphia. Products and services include gold and silver, American and foreign coins, certified rare date and modern coins, numismatic supplies and books, gold, silver, and platinum bullion, paper currency, United States proof and mint sets, including current issues. From junior collector to the experienced investor, Rabcoin has been for the industry since 1974. Founder and owner Randy Block has been an expert and an active member of the coin industry for over 45 years. Visit us at 56 Main Street in historic downtown Flemington or call toll-free 1-800-819-9875. Max Living, brought to you by the Max Challenge of Clinton, New Jersey. Join me, your host, Mark LaRose, every Wednesday at 1 p.m. right here on 100 and Chamber Radio. I'll be discussing important health and fitness subjects featuring guests and success stories. We are here to help motivate you. It's a beautiful day. When it matters most, our award-winning team of emergency physicians and nurses provides sophisticated care 24 hours a day. Superior emergency care at a moment's notice. 100 in healthcare, your full circle of care. Did you know the Hunterdon County Chamber of Commerce has over 20 active committees that you can participate in? Committees range from focus on business and government to economic development to events like our annual business expo. Contact the Chamber for more information today at 908-782-7115 or email us at info at hunterdon-chamber.org. The Hunterdon County Chamber of Commerce, the voice of business. Nice. Of course, the nicest day is when we left. You know? Of course. That's the way it goes. John Galena, our award-winning attorney here in um, Flemington, New Jersey, talking about real estate matters and so on. On I love New Jersey. Just got back from Florida. And so welcome back. Thank you. All right. So we were going to talk about landlord. What was it called? Landlord-tenant court? Land landlord-tenant law. Law. Okay. Um, okay. Generally, uh, one thing to understand, I think I said this before, is that New Jersey law is very pro-tenant, really protects tenants' rights. But Do you um, think it's fair? 
Well, when you when you look at it, uh, you have to take it piece by piece, all right? Uh -huh. Because you know the, the landlord's not running a, a free house, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was meant basically to protect tenants' rights because you know landlords uh, can't just evict you for any reason. They got to have a reason. Um, there's got to be certain notice periods. Um, like, yeah, just to give you an example, all right? Um, if a landlord comes to see me and says the tenant hasn't paid his rent, you know, and I want to evict him, all right? The first thing I ask the landlord is, did you file what they call a landlord registration statement? Most of the time, I get a blank stare. Yeah, I, what, what is that? Yeah, that is, uh, before you can evict uh, any tenant in New Jersey, it's just basically a statement. It states who the owner of the property is, um, you know, the type of unit it is, uh, who to call in the event of an emergency, if there's any man managing agent, if there's a mortgage on the property, who the fuel oil dealer is, if the if the premises are heated by uh, by oil. And you have to file that with the town mm -hmm. and serve a copy on the tenant. Unless you do that, the court has no jurisdiction to hear an eviction. Hmm. Right. Now, is the, is, what if it's an illegal rental? What, I mean, is that a complicated question? Yeah, do they people no. rent their places that aren't legal? There's legal, and then there's illegal. Yeah, well, see, that gets into being um, an eviction because the tenancy is not valid. Oh. Colin? Sorry. And, uh, I know, yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> Colin, first of all. We're reading a bill or something. <laughs> you'd also be facing sanctions from uh, the town. Okay. Um, but the landlord, if he knowingly is renting an illegal uh, premises, he's subject to, uh, you know, fines and penalties, of course. So stay and, out. And relocation costs for the tenant. Oh, boy. Okay. So, all right. So back, okay. This is a legal transaction now. I have a legal contract, and I have a tenant who doesn't pay. Right. And you're like, did you go file this form? Right. So and that can be filed, you know, very quick. Immediately. You just draw that up, and then you mail a copy certified in regular mail to the tenant. Okay. Now, for non-payment of rent, no notice is required to the tenant. You just file the complaint, you know, in court, and it gets done very quickly. You just fill out the complaint, you know, you file it, they serve it on the tenant, and uh, you're usually in court within three weeks. Wow. To have your hearing. Just one late payment, or does it take only five? Only takes one. No, yeah, because that's one. terrifying. Now, you go to court, and um, now landlord-tenant court only has... The only powers really they have is to evict the tenant, order a judgment for possession. Okay. They don't have the, the authority to award you damages. You have to file a separate lawsuit to get your money back. Wow. Okay. So what would happen is, say, for the example, a tenant owed three months' rent. Mm -hmm. The tenant would have the right to come to court and pay the rent that day. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then to they stay? stay. Right. Okay. They yep. have to show up by the end of the day with the money. Mm -hmm. Do most people wait that long when they don't get paid? Some do. I was going to say. because Unfortunately, some people fall on you know hard times, uh, you know, loss of a job or something. That's understandable. But uh, some people are like you know professional swindlers. Yeah. They'll just show up and see how long they can stay for free. And then once you evict them, they'll just move on to the next landlord that they can... Um, you know, they can rip off. That is so scary. There are companies that do, uh, you know, tenant reference checks now. Yeah. Yeah. So the well, in the real that. estate world, when we get rentals and, and we have a renter that comes through in any way, shape, or form, they have to go through more, almost as much oh, as a sure. mortgage to get sure into a place. Yeah. Yeah, they're employed and they have <clears> money and everything. And it's interesting because it is a, a different world. Like mortgage companies, renters, and rentees. Rent, uh, it's, and bu uh, keep buyers out because they have to be qualified. But a lot of the renter, rente renters, tenants, tenants <laughs> better, better said, have bad credit because they don't have a house for a reason. Yeah. So they come through saying, look, I, I, I hope you like me and I can give you some great references, but I've been on hard times. I lost my house. And now how do I get a rentor to give me the tenancy because I, I, I don't have well, great credit? You know, uh, Landlord doesn't want to go into a lease knowing that the rent's yeah, not going to get paid. Exactly. He's going to want to see yeah. at least that you're employed and you have the income. Yep. You know to pay this. Um, if for some reason or other he stops paying the rent, then you can then you can have him evicted. I can't believe it. I didn't know you could do it that fast. That's good. Yeah. Because no, I think yeah, I just assumed that people waited longer than that, but that's good to know. Good. Yeah, they have a like say for example in Hunterdon County they have a landlord tenant day. It's usually on Mondays. Oh. And <laughs> in court. And they'll come. Yeah. They'll come out and call the list mm -hmm. and you know. A lot of times, very often, when, it t when it's for non-payment of rent, the tenant doesn't show. Yeah. Because, you know, they just, uh, I guess, are in the process of moving out or whatever. But if a tenant owes the rent and th there's an order, a judgment for possession entered, and the tenant doesn't move out, then you have to go through the uh, removal process. How long does that take? Well, you have to wait three business days after the judgment for possession mm -hmm. to request the warrant for removal to issue. Is that like eviction? Well, it's, actu it's not like an eviction. Well, it's actually the removal. What does that mean? means a court officer will go there to the property you'll meet the owner will meet the uh the court officer there and a police officer if needed 
change the locks, and physically remove the tenant. Now, he'll only remove the tenant, not the tenant's property. Why? It's only their job to remove the tenant. The so property's not their problem. Now, the landlord can't just put the property out at the curb. Uh, there's a statute in New Jersey that the landlord has to safeguard the property for a certain amount of time, make arrangements with the tenant to come and get it. Uh, if the tenant doesn't do that, serve a notice upon the tenant that if they don't come within a certain amount of time, they'll dispose of the property. Can they keep it? If the tenant, you know, if they serve the appropriate notices and uh, if it's worth keeping. I mean, uh, I don't mean to be like. like <laughs> I've seen a lot of times where people that I'm were. I'm like so into this. I don't know why. I've I love real estate, so it's whatever. You know, where people that were. Uh, you learned so much. Say, hoarders. Yep. You know, didn't pay the rent and had the, the rental unit in such a bad condition that th there was nothing worth anything. It was mm -hmm. just trash to throw out. Mm hmm Wow. But no, it's, you know, there are protections for the tenant um, that the landlord's got to comply with to make sure it doesn't come back to haunt them. Mm -hmm. Just like if the tenant leaves and has a security deposit, the law requires that within 30 days you have to send to the tenant an itemized list of any de deductions you're making from the security deposit mm -hmm. and, um, you know, sending them the balance if there is any. Mm -hmm. Now, if the tenant turns around and sues you, claiming that you wrongfully withheld their security deposit and the court held holds that you did wrongfully withhold it, the tenant gets back twice the amount that you withheld plus attorney fees. Well, I guess I can understand that. I was getting terrified before when you were talking about how mostly it's a very hard tenant um, state where it's like well, the, the law, but there's the a balance right. there that's i mean i can, now that i know that if someone wasn't three months behind because i just picture if i were in a, a landlord pr uh, situation mm -hmm. if i mean it's a domino effect man if you don't pay me i'm dead you know what i mean like the well landlord's got expenses too yeah you know, yeah so i mean hey if, if they don't pay and you say it's All not it that one one non-payment where you can file the eviction action that's really cool yeah. what about like intended uses for the property as far as that goes what's the deal with that like if if someone comes into a legal rental mm -hmm. but you know that as an example my mom is going to be moving in next year because she is you know alone and she's moving in on x date yeah you got to make sure you have it in the lease mm -hmm. that uh, as to who can reside in the property and what the rules are if you break the rules the landlord can send you a notice to stop breaking the rules and if you, if you don't stop then they can um you know then evict you one thing i always tell landlords to put in their lease that any late rent payments plus if the landlord has to do any enforcement action to enforce the lease, such as uh, hire an attorney to evict you, that those items are payable by the tenant as additional rent. And that's, those are the magic words you have to have in the lease, as additional rent, because then the tenant is responsible. So if you know you have to pay an attorney to go to court and the tenant shows up the day of court saying, I want to pay the rent, and you got to pay the rent plus and the, the attorney. attorney. But it has to sit, be in the lease and say it's payable as that's additional great. rent. That's great. No, good. So they can come to you. So say someone out there is thinking about renting out their legal rental. They can come to you, and you will uh, you will help them, we'll help them with the contract. The You'll walk them through the whole thing, and then if someone comes and applies for the um, the as a tenant, you'll look out for their best interest. Yeah, I mean, you always look for those things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for the landlord, I say you know you should have this in your lease. And for a tenant, I'm saying, well, if the landlord is telling you this, if it's not in the lease, you know, many times I've had uh, I've gone to court representing tenants. Mm -hmm where the landlord comes in and they haven't filed the landlord registration statement. Mm -hmm. So it's like case dismissed, but it buys them a little more time because, you know, the first thing the landlord is going to do is go down and file the yeah, landlord registration statement. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah, that's great. All right, we'll see. You'll have about two minutes left. Is there anything else you want to make sure everybody knows out there? It's so great to have you here. No, no, nothing else I can think of unless you have any questions. Oh, no, I'm <laughs> good. I, I, I'm just, I want everybody again to know John Galena. He is an attorney at law, award winning in Hunterdon County. He is, uh, tell again about what you practice. You have real estate. Real, uh, real estate, um, landlord tenant, um, civil litigation, uh, criminal municipal court, zoning and planning. So perfect. And um, I'm Jeannie Murphy. This is I Love New Jersey. And this is Hunter in Chamber Radio. If you're out there, thank you for watching it on our Facebook stream and watch for our YouTube channel. Subscribe to it. Thank you so much for being here today. Congratulations again on your award winning. Thanks for asking me. Oh, yeah, it's great. So and thanks again for watching in. And we'll see you uh, soon. Have a great week. You're listening to WHCR DB, Hunter in Chamber Radio.com. Brought to you by the Hunter in County Chamber of Commerce, the voice of business.